Talking all things Georgia Bulldogs, spring football as G-Day approaches this weekend at Sanford Stadium with our good friend, the film guy, Brooks Austin, joins us once again. Brooks, what's going on, man? I appreciate you taking the time as always. How you been? I'm good, man. Ain't no doubt. Got a a, a little taste of a, of a football game or a football season, right? That's what I always consider spring practice. It's like a little, a little teaser, like a little appetizer for what really feels like college football season. We get like a month of faux football season where it's like hey they practice every other day and we got some shit to talk about let's we, we got football like whoa that's what spring practice has always felt like for me and yeah it, it comes to a conclusion on saturday here in athens uh, that, that's a great way to start brooks because i feel like a lot of different folks have differing opinions on spring practice especially from the fan side but of course you've been in the game you've been between the lines are you someone, do you look at spring practice and spring games? Do you draw a lot of conclusions? Like, I, I feel like for a lot of times, let's just say for the spring games, like the hype outweighs what we see because virtually it's a glorified scrimmage. But I'm sure for you, you look yeah. at it a lot differently because, I mean, you're looking at this thing from an X's and O's standpoint. You're looking at it from a competition standpoint. So I think while maybe the common fan – I mean, admittedly, the spring game can get somewhat boring because you're like, I don't really care about that third or fourth stringer. But I'm sure you see it from a different vantage point where it's like, you know, excellence breeds excellence, competition, iron sharpens iron, right? And you really get to see that in a spring game setting where you see your entire roster take the field. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I don't know how it is at other places, right? I, I know how it is here. It's the only, you know, power five football team I've ever had the opportunity to cover uh, for the last five or six years. And this is a, an extremely tight-lipped place. Like, they only allow media availability twice during the springtime, for example, right? We got to go into practice for a grand total of, I think it was 27 minutes this spring. And those 27 minutes were all individual periods. So guys are scattered all across the field with their individual coaches, and they're just doing shit on air. Like, we're not watching football. We're watching football players run around a football field. We get 27 minutes of that. And then on G-Day, we get an entire unveiling of the whole team for about two and a half hours. So, yeah, it is a tremendous evaluation period uh, for a person like me that is super inquisitive about where they stand with their roster, a roster that is completely behind closed doors for majority of the football calendar year. Uh, so, yeah, it's a tremendous opportunity to see the full depth of the roster and see it from top to bottom. But most importantly – it's a really, really big evaluation period for me for the quarterback position. I, I, I talked about it last night on our show, and everybody knows this about football, but nobody really talks about it, right? The the quarterback position is unlike any other spot, any other position, any other uh, you know role in in sports for me. In the, in this sense, right here, hey, the backup left guard, Michael Morris, we got plenty of opportunity to see him last year, like really play football, like go in there and play football. The backup quarterback is not that. The backup quarterback gets in there when they're up 35 points and he hands the ball off to the running back and then that's it. That's all we saw from him. In the spring game, we get an opportunity to watch a guy like Gunnar Stockton this year rip it 30 times on Saturday. We're going to watch him take legitimate dropbacks. We're going to be able to evaluate what he looks like in a, you know, simulated pocket, right? They're not going to live on him. They're not going to hit him. But we're going to be able to see what he's been able to develop like, what he's actually put together. Uh, and, and it's kind of a, 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 a double-edged sword for these quarterbacks because you get an opportunity to show your skill set, but that's all. That, that's all we've got to evaluate you on, and that's all the hyper uh, analysis that we're going to have is right there on that one day for you, good, bad, ugly, or great. Brooks, sticking with the quarterback position, I think what's fascinating is we, were, we recall this time last year, there was somewhat of a quarterback battle, whether it was legitimate or manufactured. I mean, I, felt, I think most folks felt like Carson Beck was going to be the guy, but we didn't necessarily know, right? It was beginning life after Stetson Bennett. Uh, what have you heard in regards to what this spring has been like for Carson Beck after? Like, there, there's no mystery. I, I'm also curious to see what it looks like behind him, but there's no mystery. He's the guy. He's the leader of this football team. This is his team. Um, I mean, I would expect all positive reports from him, but what have you heard? And then, like you mentioned, the rest of that quarterback room, I know you're excited to see that this weekend, what what that looks like behind uh, Carson as well. Yeah, I think just to start with the, the future, if you will, at the University of Georgia, I think everything is shaping up for 2025 to be Gunnar Stockton's opportunity, right? Like, you, you're going to wait your turn here. You're going to wait three years just like Carson did, uh, and then you're going to get out on the field. And by the way, I think Brock Vandergriff would have taken a very uh, similar approach 
his timeline just didn't work out. These young quarterbacks know nowadays you need at least two years of starting experience in college to be truly evaluated on the NFL level. That magical number of 25 starts is hypercritical nowadays with NFL evaluators, particularly as super seniors have become a thing, right? Where guys are entering uh, entering professional football with 50-some-odd starts. Well, they look really good as rookies because they've seen a lot of football. It's the same thing that's being happening now across the board. So Brock Vandergriff knew he was going to have to have two years of starting experience. If, had he stayed at Georgia, 2025 would have been his one singular year. And then, by the way, you would have ran into the same backlog issue with Gunner. So, yeah, it sucks for Georgia fans that Brock Vandergriff is going to be in a, in a in a Kentucky uniform this year. But from a, a, a room-needing-to-breathe standpoint – I think it worked out for everybody. So the, the future looks to be like Gunnar Stockton. He's had a very up uh, a promising spring practice by everything we've heard by all accounts. So even had a, a perfect day at practice uh, this 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 spring. So he went through an entire practice and did not throw an incompletion, something that hadn't happened per my source in at Georgia in like 15 or 20 years. Like it's it's been one of those kind of springs for Gunnar. We'll see what it looks like on Saturday. But in terms of development for Carson, everybody and their mama here in the Georgia space has been talking about one word, confidence. Okay. It's a guy that completed 73% of his balls last year, looked to be in complete command of the offense. But if there was one kind of like, hey, this is where we can get better, we wanted to see him like throw into tight windows, throw with uber confidence. Like, if you told me you throw for 70% completion percentage this year, maybe throw a, four, a few more interceptions, but our yards per attempt, our, 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 our down-the-field attempts are at a much higher rate and we're having a, a much more successful season in that department, that is progression this year for Carson Beck. And it sounds like the level of confidence has, has certainly uh, been on display this spring. Brooks, life after Brock Bowers, life after Lad McConkey. You know, I know we're not going to get the answers to these questions of who's going to step up <clears throat> in those big moments until we get to the fall and we get into those big moments, if you will. But I know Kirby Smart mentioned Dominic Lovett. Uh, there's he and others. Who has stepped up from what you've heard in regards to being that next guy, that next dude, I should say, on the Georgia offense? Yeah, well, I want to start with, with Brock Bowers. First of all, I don't know if you'll ever be able to replace, like, the, the the tight end version of him, right? But I think you have to separate what he did for Georgia, okay? And what he did was, yeah, he was a tight end. And I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, Oscar Delp is an NFL tight end. I think Oscar Delp's going to be a top 60, maybe top 75 eval when all things are said and done at the tight end position. He will be one, two, or three off the tight end board in the upcoming or the next NFL draft, whenever his time comes available. The NFL already loves him, already sees what he's put on tape. He's a six foot five, 250 pound individual that's going to run somewhere in the four fives. So like the NFL is going to take that dude. He's supremely talented. He's not what Brock Bowers was, though. And what Brock Bowers was is what we're calling around here designated pass catchers. Okay. He was positionalist last year. Okay. In years past, he played a little H, he played a little Y, he played a little slot. He was in motion a ton, right? These are designated guys that are out there to be mismatches. The NFL has a, a plethora of these as well, by the way, right? Debo Samuel is a designated pass catcher. A.J. Brown is a designated pass catcher. Puka Nakua is a designated pass catcher. They don't have positions. Their position is to get the ball and be a bitch to tackle when you get it after the catch. That role this year has been vacated, right? Brock Bowers is gone. Well, Dylan Bell's probably going to assume that role, I would imagine. Hey, who's our guy that's going to be a, a, a death mission to tackle when he has the ball in his hands after the catch? Who can we design to run to grass and be a pain in the butt afterwards? Uh, that's Dylan Bell. So you kind of got to find the, uh, the, the, the areas of Brock Bowers' game to replace. You're not going to find it in one singular human being. When you look at the offensive line, Brooks, I know that's been a talking point as well. Cedric Van Pran is gone. Jared Wilson, I think, is a guy you look at who can be that anchor at center. What have you heard about the offensive line? Of course, line of scrimmage is always the story when it comes to the dogs. We have so much fun talking quarterback or skill positions, but the trenches is one of the biggest reasons, if not the biggest reasons, that Georgia's been so successful, so dominant the last couple of years. What are you hearing about some of those position battles? We'll take it both offensively and defensively on the line of scrimmage. Yeah, I mean, from an offensive line perspective, Chris, I, I think they might be able to go eight or nine deep um, in terms of SEC winning, winning, winnable players. Like they, that's how they do it at Georgia. They don't put like a 
a specific one out of 100 grade on an individual. They kind of just grade, hey, is this guy above the winnable margins? Can we go out and win football games with this player? Um, Kirby said in years past, they've had about seven or eight of those individuals. I think this year on the offensive line, they might have close to 10, nine or 10 of guys that just – they're going to go too deep on Saturday and be a really, really winnable offensive line. Um, and, and that's a byproduct of the hit rate that they've had in the last couple cycles. But it's also a byproduct of guys like Xavier Trust and Tate Ratledge sticking around for, for an extended period of time despite NFL draftable grades that they possessed last year. You mentioned Jared Wilson. He's going to step in at center. And then outside of that, everybody else got extreme, uh, you know, <clears throat> Uh, history of playing time at the University of Georgia. <laughs> Ernest Green started last year. They're going to rotate Michael Morris and Dylan Fairchild at guard, which, by the way, they're rotating three NFL, like, first three-round type of guys at the guard position. Michael Morris is not going to start this year. Michael Morris might be all SEC caliber offensive guard. Like, that's how good of a football player he is, and he's not going to be a, quote-unquote, starter. Like, that, that's where they're at on the offensive mm -hmm. line across the board. Um, and then you flip over to the defensive side of the football. They've kind of tried – they've been avoiding a log jam essentially this spring because they have Warren Brinson and Nazir Stackhouse decide to come back for another year despite, again, an NFL draftable grade. Like if those guys went to the draft last year, they would have been anywhere from third to fifth round draft picks. And they could play their way into a second round draft eval or they could play their way into a solidified fifth round draft selection this year. But – those are NFL football players. Those are NFL, like, going to make a camp, going to make a 53-man roster football players that return while also on that interior of the defensive line. There's some really talented young football players who haven't really had an opportunity to crack the lineup in a consistent basis, right? Talk about sophomores like Jordan Hall or, or, or young or like Jamal Jerry. You're talking about uh, third-year guys like Kristen Miller that really haven't had an opportunity. These were all top 200 evals coming out of high school that they just got hanging out. Um, at, at the interior defensive line position. And then the the big storyline on that front defensive line discussion this spring has been Michael Williams moving from a defensive end role to more of a jack slash outside linebacker role. I think it's kind of a little bit overblown because me personally, I think they're removing this discussion of defensive end and outside linebacker. I think they want two six foot five, 265 pound plus freaks playing the edge. And that's what they want because that's what they need. Um, and, and they need to get away from this idea of, hey, that guy's 6'5", 290, let's play him at defensive end, and that guy's 6'2", 240, looks like a outside linebacker. That, that role doesn't exist, man. You're going to end up being uh, a, an outside linebacker who's being asked to play edge without the measurables. So if you look at their outside linebacker room nowadays, it's a bunch of Damon Wilsons hanging out, man. They got a bunch of 6'5", 240-pound freaks that they're like, hey, can we find a way to get this guy onto the field, particularly in pass rushing situations? So they're plenty deep, and I think you're going to see Georgia on that front line play, you know, eight, nine, maybe ten guys this year. Brooks, before we get off the defense, let's move to the secondary because, again, position battles abound. Uh, one of the big questions we had for Georgia is who steps up at that cornerback spot opposite of Dalen Everett. What's that been like in that secondary room, the position battle, both at corner and at safety as well? Yeah, it's been, it's been really intriguing. I think it's been one that uh, a lot of SEC football staffs are probably watching really closely to see who they might have an opportunity to attempt to poach here in about six days because <laughs> um, it is immensely talented, right? You go to the cornerback position just specifically, Dalen Everett kind of uh, was presumed to be one of the one of the two corners this spring uh, for them and, and entering the fall. It seemed like he was going to be that. And then they get about four practices into spring and they're like, hey, don't know if we're good enough right now at star. Let's move Dalen Everett over there and get him some reps. So he's playing a little nickel corner, which I think is going to open up an opportunity to maybe retain their roster a little bit because there's opened up an opportunity for three corners now to get like starter minutes, which is going to be Daniel Harris, Julian Humphrey, and Dalen Everett. And then, oh, by the way, they have the number one position player in the country in last year's class and Ellis Robinson, who looks like he's going to be a guy that's ready to play very, very soon. So, Entering the spring, it was like, hey, which one of those old guys might hit the portal or older guys, I should say, is going to hit the portal because there's not enough room for them to breathe. Well, they found room and maybe fabricated some room, it seems, for, for them to all receive some playing time this spring and fall. Brooks, 13-1 and one a season ago, two national titles in the last three years. But 
when I speak on and we speak on the 2023 season that was, there's a bitter taste in the mouth for Georgia fans because it's become winning the national championships, the standard. What's been the mood around Georgia spring practice? Has it been business as usual, or do you sense there's a little bit more of a extra chip on that shoulder to prove that Georgia's still that number one team to beat in college football? You know, I always I always use G Day and, and Spring Day as a litmus test of of what the temperature of the fan base is. Um, and even even outside of the Georgia market, if you look at Alabama's G Day at- or uh, spring game attendance at, over the years, it was like uh, lots of people mm-hmm. winning a bunch of national titles, not so many people. I would imagine that some bitches sold out on Saturday out there in Tuscaloosa this year, right? Plenty to talk about, plenty to worry about, plenty to look at. That's kind of the deal there. So we're going I'm gonna find out. I'm gonna find out Saturday how how uh energized and how hungry this fan base is for another national title, right? Last year it was kind of a moot point because they had so much stadium renovation going on, the whole half of the stadium was shut down. So couldn't really tell. What what was the vibe of the fan base last spring? Seemed kind of dead. What is the vibe of the fan base this spring? We're gonna find out on Saturday. And if that sucker sold out like it was in 2016 and in 2017 remember man like g day in 2016 when he first got the job here at at kirby smart in athens that was the biggest recruiting push he had we're going to we're going to ignite this fan base we're going to show what georgia football is going to prioritize what georgia football is going to mean moving forward g day was a huge thing for him we'll see what it looks like on saturday but from a an overall like engagement standpoint I can't complain. The numbers are good on my network. So <laughs> I mean, that's that's the only really way I can judge it. Are people reading? Are people watching? Are people showing up? Brooks, anything surprised you this spring? Has there been anything, anything in particular you've heard that's come out of camp or, or that uh, maybe you didn't expect going in? Chris, James Coley been in the SEC for a long time, right? Indeed. What do you think of, what do you think James Coley's temperament is like? Do you know anything about him? Because I didn't. I, I don't know much about him, to be totally honest with you. Outside of he he went to South Carolina, for had a cup of coffee, and then jumped over to Georgia, which I don't blame him. But don't know much about him, to be honest. Always thought kind of laid back dude. Mm-hmm. Um, always thought does great on the trail. Must be a super yeah. relationships guy. Uh, great down in South Florida in on the recruiting trail. So if you're going to be great down in South Florida, you got to have some swag about you, right? you got to have some <laughs> some uh, some ability to, to fit in and be in some room. you got to have some sauce. Bro, you got to have some sauce. Uh, <laughs> James Coley is one of the more aggressive football coaches I've ever been around. In the 27 minutes of practice observations that we got this spring, I think I heard about 27 F-bombs. I mean, just absolutely <laughs> ripping it, getting into people's ass left and right. That was a surprise for me. I, I was like, whoa. Like Normally, you go to practice, and Kirby's the animated one. Mm. I think Coley might get him. I think Coley might be a little bit more animated at practice than even Kirby Smart. And that, to me, was a little bit of a shell shock. Um, expected Colby Young to to have sources. and and Because sources at practice are one or two things, right? They're either the, the, the people on the coaching staff that you have the pleasure to talk to, or they're the boosters that are there at practice that are allowed because they pay to be there, right? <laughs> the boosters are always, always going to be mystified by Colby Young. Any Colby Young. Colby Young is six foot five, 215 pounds, and looks gorgeous. Okay. So <laughs> I wasn't surprised to hear that Colby Young has sources, uh, you know, gall- or gallivanting over his performances and his uh, viewing periods during practice. I was surprised to hear that he's trying to play special teams at Georgia because I didn't expect that. This is a six foot five, like super talented, super freaky wide receiver. He's going to buy into special teams at Georgia. Like, it's a requirement there, but, like, to hear that this is a dude that's buying in and, and attacking those practice periods, that was a little bit of a shock to me. So I, I would go with those two things. Coley mm-hmm. and some special teams, uh, you know, participation. Brooks, kickoff for G-Day set for Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Folks can check it out on SEC Network Plus, ESPN Plus, what have you. But when it comes to G-Day, you mentioned the crowd and the temperament of the fan base. But when it comes to on-field, is there anything in particular from the spring game you're looking for, you most want to see, you're anticipating? Uh, what are the top, some of the top things you're looking for most to seeing on Saturday? Yeah, we already talked a little bit about Gunnar Stockton. <clears throat> I want to see a full sample size from him, even though – 
his I asked him about this yesterday, actually. His style of play is not conducive for a a, a scrimmage environment. Like Gunnar Stockton is that's a tight window with the primary receiver. That's a tight window with the secondary receiver. I see grass in front of me. I'm gonna take this grass. Well, th that's not really an evaluation point we're gonna be able to have on Saturday. So we're not gonna get a hundred percent of Gunnar Stockton, but the 85% of Gunnar Stockton is still plenty to evaluate. The other thing I kind of talked about last night and I don't know if this is a major talking point for people outside of the space, but it's an intriguing one for me. Does Mike Bobo call plays for both units on Saturday? And the only reason I'm wondering is because if he doesn't call plays for both units, that means Todd Hartley is calling plays, you would imagine, for one of the units. And that's been my question, you know, because when you're at Georgia and, and you're at any program that succeeds at the rate that they have, your staff is constantly being poached. People are coming in constantly and trying to hire out your guys for other opportunities. And my question about Hartley has always been, are you going to go the Dale McGee route? Are you going to be the best position coach and you're in the sport for like a decade almost and then get your mid-major opportunity as a head football coach? Or are you going to go the Buster Faulkner route? Are you going to go the route where you are a, a, an offensive coordinator at a power five school <clears throat> and then you get your head coaching job at a major power five opportunity? Because that's the route, right? Mm -hmm. Prove you can call plays unless you're Shane Beamer. <laughs> Prove you can call plays, okay, at a major Power 5 level. We'll give you the opportunity to be a Power 5 head football coach, now the Power 4. Or prove that you are one of the best position coaches in Power 4 and then get an opportunity to be a head coach at the mid-major level, win, and then we'll see you at the Power 4 level as a head football coach. Does Tarn Hartley call plays on Saturday? If he does, if he if he kind of pushes for that, that kind of sets a, 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 a little – uh, tea leave off for me of this guy wants to be a coordinator someday and I, I want to know because I want to know what his future looks like because Lord knows he's already cemented himself as one of the best position coaches at the tight end position in this sport Brooks Austin talking all things Georgia football one of the best in the business at doing so aka the film guy again guys don't forget he's the director of recruiting for SI's fan nation the lead editor for dogs daily and does a fantastic job with them at Brooks Austin BA on social media. And of course, Brooks, we're all looking forward to G Day on Saturday, checking out the dogs. And like you mentioned, getting our first little little taste of college football before we start that really that long countdown till fall camp hits. Brooks, always a pleasure, man. I appreciate you taking the time. Ain't no doubt, brother. Have a good one.